this is covering the spread. Here are your hosts, Jim Sawness and Dr. Ed Feng. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Covering the Spread. That's right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com, where today we're getting you set for college football week number seven by talking to Colin Wilson of the Action Network, getting his thoughts on this week's games and talking some Arkansas football with an Arkansas alum as well. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com, joined here as always by Dr. Ed Feng. You can find his work over at ThePowerRank.com. Ed, you're coming up a crazy week of college football. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty well. It was a pretty awesome week. And uh, yeah, w- wish my bet would have done better, but we'll get into that a little bit later. There are things we can't control and yep. things include quarterback injuries, which was unfortunate. And uh, we'll talk about that for sure. But we record on Wednesdays typically for college football. And it seems like we might need to move that up because numbers are moving fast, Ed. And yep. some of those ones we're discussing with Colin today moved after I sent the rundown yesterday. And I think it's one of the situations where, I mean, we can't change our schedule too much, but like if you're betting, it's you getting in early seems to be potentially more important than it ever has been at this point. Yes. I started posting my college football numbers for members on Sundays. Uh, I will continue to do that because everything is moving like nuts on Monday. And it wasn't too long ago that college football totals would come out on Tuesday afternoons. Now they are on, on Sunday and moving like nuts. I mean, I mean, you're a little bit late if you're betting it on Tuesday. Yeah. For sure. And it's, uh, and, it's and a wild, that wild makes world. Like, and that makes talking about bets on Wednesday even harder, right? Right. Because the market's more mature. Right, exactly. And like with NFL stuff, like I'll pull numbers Tuesday morning and they're gone by Tuesday afternoon. Uh, it, there was a Viking. The Vikings open is like, I think one and a half point dogs and they were favored by a point and a half, like a couple hours later. So, I mean, that's not a move across like significant numbers, but like the money line moved quite a bit there. So wow. either way, you want to get in early, more important than ever at this point. We're going to talk about uh, some numbers we like right now with Colin Wilson. He, of course, is a senior writer for the Action Network. You can find him on Twitter at underscore Colin1. We're going to break down week seven of college football with Colin. For the NFL side of things, we'll have Joe Ostrowski on tomorrow to preview week number six. So make sure you are subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcast. Just search for Covering the Spread, hit subscribe, and leave a rating and review if you like what you hear to get Get our NFL and college football breakdowns each and every week. Before we go on to talk to Colin, though, we need to go back to last week, talk about the quarterback injury that went against Ed and break down all that went down in week number six. Covering the past. Last week here on Covering the Spread, we had Edward Egros on to break down week six. You can find Edward on Twitter at Ed with Sports and check him out on TVG and NBC Sports Edge. Edward was in some totals for last week. Fortunately, one of them was Oklahoma, Texas. He liked the under on 63 and a half for that game. It moved against him, closing at 66, and that game got bananas. We'll talk more about that uh, with Colin in just a bit, but finished at 103 points thanks to a crazy comeback there. Uh, so a loss in that one. Edward had Georgia and Auburn under 47 and a half. This one was good for both movements and good results for Edward. Dropped to 46 at close. Georgia's defense really did clamp down. They held Auburn to just 10 points there. And that allowed the under to hit at 44 points for that one. So good call by Edward on that total. Final total for Edward was the under on 50 and a half for Michigan versus Nebraska. It did shift down a half point at close. And it looked great for the first quarter and a half. Uh, The first (laughs) half, uh, 13 total points. There were no points in the first quarter. Things got a bit crazy in the second half. The over did hit at 61 total points. And Ed, probably an entertaining game for you up in Ann Arbor. um, And uh, a fun one, at least in the second half, to see how things played out. Yeah, it was entertaining. I mean, I I think Nebraska's offense played really well in the second half. They brought out a bunch of misdirection plays that really had Michigan's defense unprepared. Uh, But at the end of the game, another fumble. By Adrian Martinez, and uh, yeah, Michigan was able to get the win. So, and you did research into fumbles on the NFL side, and how it was about how quarterback sacks lead to fumbles, and like there was a heavier correlation there. Is that correct? If I remember correctly, well, I mean, the basic fact in the NFL is that you know about a third of all fumbles lost happen from quarterback sacks, 
Mm -hmm. So the idea is that the quarterbacks have the ball so much that they play a huge role in fumbles just because they have the ball so much. And I'd be shocked if that is also not true. And if it were not true in college football, Adrian Martinez has the ball a lot. He has problems holding on to the ball. Uh, it has cost Nebraska. And Nebraska also had another, um, there was another study of fumbles with Nebraska that a journalist there did. And they've had the worst fumble luck over like a decade and a half. And it was really like, so fumble recoveries are supposed to be pretty random, but they found that like they, they had recovered a statistically shockingly small fraction of fumbles on defense huh. over a 15 year period. So I guess, I guess the story really isn't new. If you, if you right. look at Nebraska right. over the like, last 15 years, they've had issues with fumbles. Some of it is probably stuff that could be fixed. Some of it is probably just random. Yeah. With Adrian Martinez, it's worth it, you know, to, you know, you'll take that trade off to have him and you just wish you'd scrub out the fumbles at some point there. Uh, but his talent worth it, at least either way. As far as the sides go, Edward, like Arizona State, minus 12 and a half. And this one did move in his favor as well. Arizona State closed as a 13 and a half point favorite versus Stanford. <laughs> Uh, ASU scored late in the third quarter to take an 18 point lead. And then the defense held pretty firm from there. So Edward was able to hang on and get the cover there. So uh, two and two, and then Edward finished three and three because you were head to head against Penn state versus Iowa. He, he was on Iowa minus one and a half. You had bet Penn state when it was plus two and a half and the Shane, the Sean Clifford injury, kind of the, the Didn't bet early enough. Yeah. That was the Could have had Penn state plus here. three. Oh, that was available at open? That was where it opened at, yep. Oh, man, that's that's really rough. And add that on to the fact yeah, that, well. you know, they could still could have covered despite uh, Clifford getting hurt had he gotten the three. Came close. Um, they were up 17-10 when Clifford left. And Taquan Robinson came in, really struggled, threw a couple picks. He turned 21 pass attempts into 34 yards. So even when he did complete passes... Wasn't doing a whole lot. Uh, Iowa rallied kind of ish. They won outright. They got the cover as well, but like not a whole lot you can do when you've got situations like that from a betting perspective. Yep. That was a bummer. Yep. Alas. Um, but I think that's about all you can do. So you had bad luck too with the Ryan Fitzpatrick injury in week one. So I don't know if you're just like cursing quarterbacks out here at or something like that, but uh, I don't know. A little, a little well, suspicious. <laughs> Yeah, the week one thing, like, I don't know, the Chargers dominated that game, so it's not. Yeah. That one doesn't bother me too much. The Penn State one was a little bit different, though. Yeah, for yeah. sure. All right. Well, hopefully we can turn our luck around in week number seven, which we'll talk about here in just one second. But first, hockey is back. The NHL season is back with games going on all this week. And FanDuel is giving you the chance to get in on the action by opting into the NHL parlay insurance offer. All you got to do is place a four plus like parlay on NHL games between uh, between now and October 19th. If exactly one leg of your bet loses, get a refund in site credit. Max refund $25 per day. Kick off the NFL's or the NHL season the right way by heading over to FanDuel Sportsbook and placing an NHL parlay. Must be 21 plus and present in Arizona, Colorado, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, Virginia, or West Virginia. Refund issued as non-withdrawable site credit that expires in seven days. Max refund $25. Restrictions apply. See full terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG. In Indiana, 1-800-9-WITH-IT. For confidential help in Michigan, 1-800-270-7117. In Tennessee, call the red line at 1-800-889-9789. In West Virginia, 1-800-GAMBLER.net. Or in Arizona, call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text Next Step to 53342. Covering the present. Let's bring Colin Wilson on to covering the spread now to preview week number seven across college football. Colin, we appreciate the time. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm uh, staring at a board full of uh, wonderful games. Uh, I couldn't ask for anything more when I've been diagramming Louisiana Tech and UTEP all morning over eight cups of coffee. So uh, <laughs> just another week in college football. Isn't it good, though, to have a come down after this past week? Because, like, I feel like we need, like, a breather to, like, decompress after what happened this past weekend. There was a five-minute corridor where 
Arkansas and Ole Miss came down to the end and Sam Pittman went for the two-point conversion and OU and Texas came down to the very end with Spencer Rattler converting the two. That all happened within a couple minutes. And you're just not going to get a peak like that. Like, it's nice to have a week where I don't think I'm going to have that kind of emotional spike. Yeah, well, well, but then you had like the spike kind of at the end. I mean, I was heading to bed when the the Bama uh, Texas A and M game ended, and I was like, "This is not happening, is it?" Um, so yeah, there was there was a lot. I, there was Texas A and M fans that were texting me at the game. They said, "Where are we really? Am I in a dream? Are we really doing this?" And I'm oh, like, good, I'm not, you know, "Where's that Calzada came from? I don't know where that came from." So yeah. yeah I mean, where, where did he come from? Right. I mean, <laughs> <you laughs> well, I, we did We did our podcast on the action network and I, I took Texas A&M over my Razorbacks and the Razorbacks. I, I had them, you know, covering Texas and I had all these things laid out about it. And then when we got to the Texas A&M handicap, it says, Hey, you know, we've got these players, Texas A&M and Jimbo have been loading up on recruits for yep. years, top five recruiting classes. And you look at a Shane and Demas and Aeneas Smith, like they have the players from an explosive standpoint to hang with Alabama but Zach Calzada has had so such bad accuracy issues that and the offensive line has not been healthy that you're not going to be able to challenge Alabama. All of that got taken care of in one game. So things I expected to see out of Texas A&M at the beginning of the year, they finally came to fruition against Alabama. Yeah, yeah. it was a, a fun weekend for sure. And I did want to talk to you about Arkansas because you mentioned them. Uh, you are an Arkansas alum. They get Auburn this week. Uh, Auburn wasn't quite fun enough for me to put in the rundown for the three games we'll discuss. But I, I still want to get your thoughts. You know, you obviously pay close attention to them. You're okay betting against Arkansas at times. So what's your read on them in general, but specifically here against Auburn this weekend? Yeah, I couldn't be more happier with the direction of Arkansas football. I mean, this is uh, a team that used to not be able to get themselves up off the mat under Chad Morris and Brett Bielema. They would take a loss and then everything would snowball. But now you have Sam Pittman and he now has a history of when Arkansas has taken losses. They come back the next week and they beat people. Uh, I think last year Georgia beat them by, you know, 20 something. And the next week, everybody thought Mississippi State was going to be national champions because they beat LSU and they beat Mississippi State as double digit dogs. <laughs> And so when you get a pounding by Georgia and you get shut out, is there a hangover next week? No, there is a boat race with Ole Miss able to score points. And for Sam Pittman, I, I know we lost the game, but for a head coach to realize that you don't want to get into an overtime with Matt Corral, when we drain clock, score a touchdown, and Matt and Sam Pittman just throws two fingers up in the air and says, we're going for two, like we're going to end the game right here. Uh, that lets me know as alumni that, uh, we're in good hands. Uh, we we are being very well coached. Now you fast forward to Auburn. I know I, we have a, you know, when you're a handicapper, you got to take strength of schedule in there. And it's really tough because we've got Akron and Alabama state in there, but we've also got, you know, Penn state. Uh, so Auburn's kind of a mixed bag when it comes to stats, they've already fired their wide receivers coach and then all, and you know, you need these Bo Nicks, amazing super tech mobile type plays uh, to get these drives home. So they're a really tough handicap, but one thing they do well is they stop the rush and Arkansas has a four added monster. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a big battle. And then if we don't get that, then it's just KJ Jefferson trying to throw to Traylon Burks and, and, and he's covered by four different people. So uh, I probably will end up on Arkansas. I don't have any money on it right now, uh, but I expect it to be higher scoring than, than what the board has. Excellent. Well, Colin, we're really excited to have you on the show for the first time. Uh, partially, with your writing, but also you have a model that you publish over at the, the Action Network. Uh, tell us a little bit about this model, the inputs, and, and what you do to get your ratings. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that, like, you know, Sagarin has been around forever, and Bill Connolly's SP Plus, SNP Plus, or SP Plus. <laughs> That's a whole legal it's thing. Been, <laughs> yeah, it's been around forever. But what's interesting is about 15 years ago, uh, I was doing another career. I was a software consultant, but I love to fly into Vegas and bet on college football. But more importantly, I like to take the odds makers out to dinner or to have a drink and say, how do you guys come up with these numbers the next day? I, I really want to know because as a guy that's got an engineering degree, I want to backwards engineer how we got to pit minus seven versus Georgia Tech. How did that happen? And I think when you look at what the odds makers do, I wanted to take a little bit of a flavor of what, how they come up with their numbers and their process and then I wanted to look at the five factors of college football that Bill Conley wrote up in 2014. I want to integrate the two together. So from an odds maker standpoint, what they do is the closing line is paramount to everything. So if a number opens 21, but it closes 28, 
then you're going to have to make a PR for the two teams that comes out to a, a spread of 28. And then, you know, they'll do an adjustment, a point or two here. If the post game win expectancy is a little off because there was too many turnovers, it was a fraud box score or something like that. And then when you integrate things that Bill Connolly wrote about years ago, almost a decade ago about explosiveness and success rate and, and, and finishing drives, when you add those into teams, you can modify the point spread even, you know, I'm sorry, you can modify the power rating even more. And that's what I do over at Action Network. So even though our power ratings are not a Sagarin or an SP plus, I know what the odds makers, how they make those numbers and they don't pay attention to success rate and explosiveness whatsoever. I know how Bill mathematically makes his numbers, but injuries and social situations and things happening inside, outside the locker room, the bookmakers do know and move numbers on. That's not a part of SP plus. So really it's a combination of both. So are you, is it, is it like you're, you're, you're updating, you, you have a rating and then you're updating based on where the market closes and then a whole bunch of other stats. Is that, is that kind of essentially it? essentially it we get to the closing line number and then we ask ourselves and this is what the odds makers do they say what would i make that game again so if alabama closes minus 18 if they were to play a and m seven days later what would you make the spread well obviously it would probably be like 15 and a half 14 and a half it wouldn't be like X, texas a and would be favored that's where you separate fans from sharp gamblers right i mean fans think yeah. texas a should be favored and then once you get into it you say well it could have been a fluky game from a success rate standpoint or an explosiveness standpoint. And, and I wrote a story over the summer and I've been dying to do this for years. I, I took data from all back to the 2014 season because, you know, if you look at the, if you look at college, if you look at football study hall, the, the bill Conley wrote, it was like 88% of the teams that win success rate win the games and 77% mm -hmm. explosiveness win the games. And so I said, well, that's great. But what about against the spread? So I went back and took all the teams back from 2014 and I wanted to know what are the, of all the five factors, what are the ones that determine the best against the spread metric? Turns out it is success rate, defensive success rate and defensive finishing drives defined as when drives get past the 40 yard line, how many points are you putting up on the board? So now success rate and finishing drives, I immediately get into an advanced box score after a game and that's how I adjust my power ratings. But how stable is that defensive uh, finishing drives bit? I believe it's more stable than the red zone numbers because the red zone, there's not as many attempts once you get past the 20. Yeah. Uh, sure. field, field goals, touchdowns being scored. I think points per possession past the 40 is a better outlook than me just dumping red zone. So, right. You know, right. Because because you're expanding the sample size. I completely believe that. Right. I'm just trying to think back because I've, I've always thought this and then I've never checked it, um, just how predictive that is. So I would definitely, yeah. Turns so, out, uh, it turns out it's 63%. Like, well, once I saw 63% against the spread when you win finishing drives, I was, well, okay, well, now I have to bring finishing drives. That, that gets a little bit of a bump for me. Yeah, so, no, no. I mean, I completely believe that it matters in winning, but just, I guess my question was like, how much does finishing drives before today going to predict the rest of the season right yeah exactly and i would think that is less stable than your success rate yeah uh, yeah exactly from a predictive standpoint. there are some teams out there in college football that i, I believe i cited a team in our action network podcast last week last week that they had allowed 14 red zone attempts all 14 be touchdowns and i said <laughs> i'm taking it over on this team <laughs> everybody gets a touchdown so yeah um, so your goal in looking back at comparing success rate to spread and stuff like that was to determine what books were not accounting for. Is that the the goal for you in doing so? Yeah. And so, and so there are odds makers that I'm, I mean, one of them I'm very close personal friends with is one of the top in the game right now. And he does not pay attention to success rate or finishing drives or any advanced metrics whatsoever. He does pay attention to strength of schedule. It is mm -hmm. a big part of the odds makers process of building it. But once they get into Hey, I have a mismatch here where one team is really good in standard downs. That'd be Texas. Like Texas is averaging eight yards every time they're first and 10 uh, versus a team that is just arm tackling and they're dead last in, in, in tackling for PFF via PFF. You know, that that's a big deal. There's going to be a lot of explosive plays. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think we should be like specific about what the bookmakers consider. Cause I think Colin, you're saying the bookmakers are not considering success rate when they open up that opening no. line. No, right. They are they are certainly considering success rate because they're adjusting their lines based on the market. Yes. And those people with betting into the market 100 percent 
are using success rate. Uh, I actually had Preston Johnson on my podcast earlier. He's a pro college football better. And he, he was, he was really funny. He's like, yeah, last time I was on here, I didn't really want to talk about success rate because I don't want to tell people about that. Yep. Well, Preston, no, I have yeah. friends, Preston, and I have been friends for a decade. So, I mean, this line of thinking that we've had for a long time has, we've just, we haven't really wanted to tell the other side of the counter and in our, <laughs> in our media world, we haven't really wanted to tell the rest of the media world, but it's yeah. such a big deal. It's there's a huge Delta between those numbers yep. and where the odds makers are. No, exactly. And that's why you see, that's why, you know, I mean, you're, I want to talk about this at the beginning of the show, but like the market has changed so much in the sense that, you know, totals are out Sunday, right? It wasn't too long ago that totals were out like Tuesday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And you're just seeing that market go crazy on Mondays, right? And um, a lot of that is, you know, I think these sharp betters who are using success rate because they figured out it's the most sticky thing um, coming in with their perspective on things. And, um, you know, Preston's certainly one of them. Yeah, and tempo plays a really big deal into that too. And I know that odds makers do use a little bit of tempo, but, you know, explosive plays play a big part of that too. Your Your tempo can be you know, uh, affected by if you score within five seconds versus if you're Coastal Carolina and it takes you 10 minutes uh, because you decided to go 18 plays and then get your seven points and drain clock it. It's a really interesting dynamic. Yeah, that they consider pace given the total being 82 and a half for Ole Miss Tennessee. I think we can say there's at least a sprinkle of that in there for sure. Now you mentioned Texas. I want to talk about them in a second, but first let's talk about their opponent last week because Oklahoma – tentatively made the switch at least uh they put caleb caleb williams in over spencer rattler you had talked about this in your week six preview post up yeah. on the action network about how this was a possibility it's not definitive yet that it'll be williams going forward kind of looks like it probably should be but like it's not definitive yet so with that in mind does his potential presence impact your view of oklahoma in the futures market they're minus 150 to win the big 12 right now and 20 to 1 to win the national championship uh, I love Caleb. With Caleb Williams, Caleb Williams is the quarterback. I love them more. Now, full disclosure, I bought OU 10 to 1 back in January, March, anywhere I could find it coast to coast. I loved OU because their defense had improved year over year under Alex Grinch. And Spencer Rattler's numbers were Heisman esque last year as far as big time throws versus turnover worthy plays. That's all disappeared for him whatsoever. There's some stories coming out. They changed the run blocking scheme. That's why the running backs haven't been that well, but they've scrapped that and they've gone back to normal. Uh, Spencer Rattler still is not passing deep. And when he does, he's getting picked off. He's making some very terrible decisions on passes that go past 10 yards. And the switch to Caleb Williams, I knew was coming. I mean, I, I when you watched Texas the week before against TCU, Max Duggan did whatever he wanted. Run the zone read, make a decision whether I'm going to hold on to it or throw it down the field. And that's exactly what Caleb Williams' game is. That is not Spencer Rattler's game. If Spencer Rattler wants to hold on to the zone read, nobody's scared. And what happens now is with Caleb Williams at quarterback, the linebackers have to respect him like they do Matt Corral and stay in the box. And that frees up wide receivers to get more separation, to have some more one-on-ones. Caleb Williams over Spencer Rattler is a huge adjustment for me. Uh, I love Oklahoma futures if Caleb Williams is the starter. Now, of course, I'm tracking practice reports every day. If Nick Rattler was at practice, he did not practice, but he was there. And Lincoln Riley stood next to him the whole entire time, like a kindergarten session. I'm not sure what's going on. Well, Caleb Williams worked with all the, the first stringers. So uh, we'll see who the starter is and if it's going to be his mix and match. But I, I like OU's chances a lot better with Caleb Williams. So, Colin, what, uh, what about the defensive side of the ball? I think last I checked, uh, my numbers didn't really like Oklahoma. Um is it just randomness? Is the talent? I mean, I, I think the story was that they were pretty good last year and they brought a lot of those guys back. Yeah, Alex Grinch, the defensive coordinator, did amazing things at Washington State. He got a little buried in the staff at Ohio State before he came and took this job. And he's known for always having top 25 in defensive havoc. He's known for always being top 25 in success rate. And that's not happening this year. And you didn't lose anybody from last year's team that, I mean, they, they lost their first two games and they smoked everybody else the rest of the season. A lot of that was defense. And they're just not getting to the quarterback. They're just not stopping third down conversions. I give them a pass against Texas. I think what Steve Sarkeesian is doing down there in Austin is amazing from an offensive standpoint. Like the, what they're able to accomplish from a success rate and now explosiveness with Casey Thompson is a big deal. So I give a pass on those numbers, but you're correct. The OU defense is nowhere near what it was last year. 
Yeah. So that's the Oklahoma side of things. Let's talk Texas now. They got Oklahoma State this week. The spread is Texas minus five and a half. Total here, six and a half. And this is a fun matchup here because we're seeing Casey Thompson against a very good Oklahoma State defense. And Thompson, like you said, been great so far. Do you think he can keep it up here? And what I think is a pretty tough test. Yeah, Sark and Knowles. This is a really big matchup of uh, two masterminds of what they do best. But, you know, Casey Thompson came in on the last drive against Arkansas, and that was it for Hudson Card. And I, and I said this, you know, I, I believe over and over each week, the first two games of the season, Hudson Card led zero explosive drives. They were successful in moving the chains because of John Robinson, but no explosive drives. And once Casey Thompson came in, everything changed completely, uh, especially from the passing attack. Uh, so, you know, I, this is a Texas offense that I very much believe in. I knew they were going to put up a ton of points against OU. I think that they can do the same here against Oklahoma, uh, Oklahoma State. But the real handicap in this game against Oklahoma State is the defense of Texas. They, the players don't match the Pete Kwiatkowski system, the 4 2 5 that he ran up in Washington. It is not translated in Austin whatsoever. And whether that's just a personnel mismatch or maybe it's coaching or maybe it's scheme, I, we have no clue. But right now, they're allowing everybody to score a maximum amount of points. So I can't see a scenario where Oklahoma State is not scoring at least four touchdowns in this game. No matter if they have a really bad game, an inept game, uh, they're still going to score a ton of points here. So, uh, you know, for me, the over is the look, considering Texas is bottom 15 in, in defending the pass, defensive havoc, uh, finishing drives. There's just going to be a lot of points in every Texas game. Now you mentioned defensive havoc a couple times. Uh, what what goes into that? You know, what's the calculation to decide that number? Yeah, so havoc is different on both sides of the ball. So for defensive havoc, you're looking at pass breakups, interceptions, kind of the same thing as a PBU, uh, tackles for loss behind the line of scrimmage, and forced fumbles. Now, I I don't really factor in. I know there's fumble luck and turnover margin, all these other stats. But for me, if you're able to just punch the ball out. Whoever gets it is a coin flip. It's always a coin flip once the ball is on the ground. So forced fumbles are a bigger stat for me than anything else. So you combine all of those numbers that you accumulate and you divide them by the number of defensive plays that you've ran or, or, or been involved with. And that comes up to a percentage of how many times you created havoc uh, in the form of knocking down passes, punching out the ball or tackling by the line of scrimmage. Offensive side, pretty much the same thing. It's number of offensive plays divided by all those factors. Awesome. So let's move up to the Big Ten. Uh, we have Michigan State and Indiana. Michigan State's four and a half point favorite on the road. Uh, total has gone down to 48 and a half. Michigan State is uh, a team that looks to be on the rise. And uh, Indiana really hasn't lived up to any preseason expectations. And uh, I'm not sure if Michael Penix is playing. So what do you see in this game? Well, I think the jury is still out on Michigan State. I mean, the only game that they didn't cover was a Nebraska game that went to overtime and they were gifted a turnover. Uh, and, and, you know, the Spartans <laughs> were able to win by three. Nebraska right now is like a covering machine. I They can't win a game. Oh my God. But the, when you see a plus three and a half on the board with Nebraska, it's like you have to play because you know the game's going to end three in overtime. But, uh, you know, I, I think the jury is still out on Michigan State. They, I mean, they beat Miami. But they were given four turnovers, right? And then they they cover Northwestern, Rutgers, Youngstown State. I mean, it just doesn't put a lot of confidence in me. So when you put in that strength of schedule, it, it's really nice that Peyton Thorne has a 14 to 2 TD to INT ratio, and nobody's been able to stop Jalen Naylor. I think that's where the handicap starts uh, with Indiana. Uh, you know, Indiana, they're excellent against explosive passing, they're top 20 against ex, uh, explosive passing. Tom Allen is a defensive coach. It shows with his tackle grading at PFF, they're 15. And so when you're able to stop explosive passing and you're able to tackle, then these teams like you're not going to let Jalen Naylor just go down the field for 80 yards every time that he touches the ball. So I think explosive plays are going to be at a minimum. And you mentioned with Michael Penix. We don't even know if he's healthy. I don't think he's been healthy all year. He's had a new set of targets he hasn't gotten familiar with besides Ty Freifogel. I'm not expecting a whole ton of points out of these guys. Uh, I mean, I would need a seven just to consider Indiana. The number keeps steaming. I saw three and a half, four and a half. I think there's some fives. I would need at least a seven before I'd start considering Indiana. But I think considering Indiana's defense and what they lack on offense, an under 48 and a half could be the play. But even better, uh, I think there's a 24 and a half first half. Uh, probably the best bet. So you mentioned you mentioned Nebraska against Michigan State. Um, the play that really stood out to me in that game was when Nebraska punted and everyone went after the wrong punt returner. 
Like I've never I've never seen anything like this. Like four Nebraska uh, cover guys go to the wrong guy. The other Michigan State guy catches it and runs it back for a touchdown. Uh, I I can't explain what's going on with Nebraska because they started covering games after Scott Frost made an announcement that he was no longer friends with the team. He's now going to be Mr. <laughs> Mr. Hardass. I don't know if anybody else read this. Like, they lost the Illinois game, and he's like, I'm done being friends with everybody on the team. I'm now going to play a father figure and be a hard ass, and I'm going to coach them hard. And now they're covering. They're not winning, but they're covering. I, I don't know what the, the coaching staff needs. A, they need a clean house there. Trev Alberts might do yeah. it. Too. No, yeah, it's interesting. So, I mean, they kind of had that play. And first of all, I don't think as a coach you can be friends with your players. So, <laughs> right? You're the boss. Right. Yeah. You have responsibilities or you're going to get fired. Like, it's not friendship. It, it has to be a relationship. That can turn into a friendship, um, but but it's I mean yeah this this Nebraska team has been fascinating because they did cover against Michigan, and watching that game here in Ann Arbor very tight. Um, Nebraska's offense played great in the second half, but it you know that things are bad in Lincoln when you know Michigan fans are kind of feeling bad for them. It's like oh yeah, <laughs> Adrian Martinez fumbled again. Yeah, we knew that was going to happen. All right, they lost the game. Yeah, if you're so, getting it's a wild situation out there. Yeah, if you get Michigan's pity, that that's a bad thing. I do think Scott Frost will stay on until the end of the season. I, I I wonder what his entire campaign in Lincoln would have been without Adrian Martinez, easily the most explosive quarterback, I don't know, maybe in the conference because he can take off at any down and go run for a touchdown. But at the same time, it's like it, it's you can't predict fumbles, but this kid always puts it on the carpet. It's picked up, and that decides the game at the end every single time, every year. Yeah, no, it's completely wild. I mean, from watching Nebraska this past Saturday, I kind of feel like you can't really fire Frost. Right. Like they they played well, and, you know, bad things happen. And I understand you get fired because bad things happen. But, I mean, that was my impression. You know, like, I, I couldn't really, you know, I saw them against Illinois in the opening game and wondered what the heck was going on. But mm -hmm. seeing them in a full game against what I think is a good Michigan team, I mean, it's a good football team. They're just they're just not getting the results. Yeah, not, they're not getting the results. The defense is actually legit. They're playing very good, especially in the back half, the coverage unit, uh, defending the pass. And Scott Frost brought his entire staff from UCF. So Eric Shenander runs this 3-4 that, like, blitzes, like, on half half, half of snap. So at least it's getting home. Uh, yeah, I think the defense is fine. It's just this, this consistency on offense. They. Yeah. They have a stable of running backs that is just not getting any yards after contact. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting program to keep an eye on uh, for sure. For better or for worse, they're interesting. I think that's always fun. Let's talk about our final game here. Kentucky versus Georgia. Battle of the undefeateds in name, at least. Uh, Georgia now a 21 and a half point favorite. That is uh, down from 23 and a half yesterday. Total is 44 and a half. And we know Georgia. There's nothing to talk about there too much. But let's talk Kentucky because... Strike the schedule does matter. What's your read on them so far this year? Well, I mean, Kentucky's had a really great season, and Mark Stoops is going to be one of the hottest names on, on the job market when, when the time comes, when the LSUs come open, when some of the other positions come <laughs> open. Uh, Mark Stoops' name is going to be up there. So, uh, you know, you have to love what they've done on both sides of the ball. Their offensive possessions, half of them have had two-plus first downs, so they've been very successful in moving it. And they've doubled the national average in explosive drives. I mean, that's an explosive drive is is um, is defined by having a, a drive that averaged more than ten yards per play. And, and Kentucky is doing that in half of oh, double the national average, which is a little bit crazy. Seven point four yards in passing downs. They're they're converting a lot of third downs. Uh, you know, the defense has been serviceable. They're allowing teams to kind of push them around, but in sixty eight opponent possessions, only two of them have been explosive drives. So the defense has been very good at limiting the deep ball or anything on the ground. Uh, they are giving up first downs, but nothing big is, is coming out of that. You know, all that said, I'm not backing them against Georgia. I think as a guy that has my head in the spreadsheet all day, I have to pull back at some point and realize that Kentucky winning against Florida at home, it's been, I think, since the 80s. Uh, you know, I mean, that was a monster win for that program. I think they're still partying about it. And they beat up an LSU team, which I thought LSU would have a chance, but they're little with you know their one-dimensional pass. They had no chance. Kentucky is coming off two emotional home games, uh, and now they have to go on the road uh, into a, a extremely hostile environment. 
and, and try to get it done against Georgia. And I know over at Action Network, I, I put this in some of my writings over through, through the first month, some of these kids have not been in hostile environments where they haven't had crowds on top of them or the offensive line or the quarterback can't get communication across because these crowds are so heavy. And some of them sophomores, they maybe have never even seen a crowd like this before. So do we count the one time Kentucky went on the road against South Carolina? The score, the final score was 16 to 10. That was a game they really struggled to get points up on the board. So Kentucky on the road coming off of two home emotional wins, you pick my head out of the spreadsheet and I say, well, I have to back Georgia in this case, but the number really should be 21. I, I think that's the book saying, we know that we're gonna take a lot of Georgia money and we're gonna protect ourselves here. And you know what Kentucky's gonna do. They run the ball 62% of the time. Arkansas runs it just a little bit more and Georgia just completely shut them out. So I'm not sure Kentucky's gonna be able to score many points here. At the same time, the JT Daniels, Stetson Bennett, Stetson Bennett is actually running tempo. He's actually throwing deep. Uh, you know, so taking all that into account, I think Georgia minus 13 and a half in the first half is the best play. Um, I, I would take it at 22 on Georgia, but not not for a whole, you know, large volume here. I like the first half better against Kentucky. Excellent. Um, I want to ask you, you, you threw in the LSU job as potentially being open. Um, what, what are Coach O's prospects? I mean, you come into the season, I mean, yeah, your quarterback gets hurt, but it was a team that I th- – I, well, I don't know if I thought, but I think the numbers and the the pundits all thought there was talent on that defense to yeah. really make a surge, and that that simply has not happened. So, what's your take with Coach O? There's a, there's a lot to break down here because you know this how this how this year began is that Coach O made the decision that he wanted to try and replicate 2019. So his offensive coordinator was filled by a guy that worked one year under Joe Brady over for the Carolina Panthers. I don't think that's the best representation to try to get 2019 back is to get a guy that served as an assistant to Joe Brady at the Carolina Panthers. But uh, that guy comes into LSU. He's trying to run the same thing. But Miles Brennan is the quarterback that they wanted. Why? Because he can throw deep and he's accurate. Max Johnson cannot throw deep and is not accurate. And now we've had problems with the offensive line where there's just no continuity whatsoever with injuries, injuries and the running back. So now it's all a one dimensional offense. And I think that they're just flying by the seat of their pants when it comes on the offensive side defense. Now we have injuries to Ollie Gay, a lot of key members. Eli Ricks is out this weekend. Derek Stingley's not going to play for the rest of the season. Those are two names that are going to get drafted in the first round of the NFL draft. I don't believe that Edo is going to make it through the season. I think by the time we're all at Thanksgiving dinner, he will not have a job. Uh, so, and that's not. I would like to say that that's just not me, like, you know, kind of like taking a guess in the air. Uh, there are people at Action Network uh, that I work with that kind of have a plug into some of the coaching. And, you know, I believe that Scott Frost will be there to the end of the year. Coach O is number one on the list of coaches that will not be employed by Thanksgiving. And it's such a wild situation in the SEC that if that happens, you would have had two coaches within the last 15 years that won a national championship and been an out two years later. Crazy. And yeah. It's crazy because you have the talent. There's so much talent in these places. You get a generational quarterback, you figure out everything else, you win a national title, and then reality hits over the next two years. And it's just it just it's just wild. But it's and, not even that outlandish either, because they've they've hit the snowball zone where things are bad and then they get worse. You mentioned Stingley, like he's not gonna play this year. Like once you get to that point, we saw this last year too, same with LSU, where guys like Terrace Marshall start opting out. And it's not like an opt-out situation, but you're seeing the snowball occur, which can lead to changes early on, kind of as you alluded to. Yeah, and, and their tackling grade is getting worse and worse and worse. Like they're falling in, and there's a lot of arm tackles. You can, I think Kirk Herbstreit called him out three weeks ago and said, is there a will to want to play on this LSU? Right now? He said that three weeks ago. And now after watching you know, what's gone down the last couple of weeks, I would take – whoever LSU's opponent is, I would take their team total over. And I would, I, I don't think LSU has anything left in the tank for the rest of the season. Yeah. We'll see how that so plays out. And, and you talk yeah. about trying to reproduce 2019. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's a matter of like finding a guy who couldn't win a job at another program and turning him into the first pick in the NFL draft. Right. These, these aren't reproducible type situations. No, not at all. And, uh, there was, uh, I would call the 2019 LSU team one of the more magical 
like you know like the moon and the sun and the cosmic car like everything came i mean getting joe brady as your offensive you know as your passing game coordinator uh and, and getting joe burrow from ohio state was like the perfect marriage of an extremely accurate passer with a system that had clyde edwards Hilaire that could catch a ball out of the backfield and give you some relief that was a per and remember they couldn't play any defense either i've said this a ton of times they gave up i think 40 points to vanderbilt in one of their first six games and Grant Delpit was like their nickelback. He he missed like 20 tackles in the first six games. And then all of a sudden, Dave Aranda was able to figure it out. And uh, Dave Aranda, one of the best defensive minds, you know, in, in all of FBS football now at, at Baylor, he was able to get that tackling uh, unit turned around. It was just fundamentals. And offensively, that they just never stopped scoring ever. No one could ever figure that out. Uh, and you're not going to replicate that. So I, I don't know why you would try in the first place. Making an outlier, your, your template is usually not going to go super well in general. So I think that could be a lesson, a big takeaway here. Uh, a lot of other games on the board, Colin, you mentioned it's not the best, you know, slate by any means. But hey, we can bet on those too. We bet on the bad games too. Uh, so what are the games are you seeing value for this weekend? Well, I I made a couple of lists, a little short notes on a couple of lists for you guys. And believe it or not, it starts off with Nebraska. I mean, it, it's there we gross, go. All right. It, it, it's gross. It, all Most some of these games are gross. But at four, it's actually time to consider buying in on Minnesota, a Minnesota team that lost to Bowling Green. Nebraska's just been incapable of closing out these games. And I mean, even though, you know, the Gophers took that loss to a MAC team, they've been excellent in defense and passing downs. And Nebraska has issues stopping the rush and the Gophers run 70% of the time. So I think at four, that's really where you want to start looking at Minnesota. Other than that, you can go to the Mac. Eastern Michigan was a big play for me last week as an underdog. Chris Creighton just gets it done from a covering the spread perspective in the Mac. And now they're taking on a Miami of Ohio team that uh, is really struggling this season. And, and, and EMU, they're, they're top 25 in defensive rush and pass expected points. So I expect them to win that game. Keep your eyes on Louisiana Tech going to UTEP. Uh, Austin Kendall, their quarterback, is completely healthy. They're coming off of a bye. And UTEP has extreme issues defending explosive passing. And then the last one I have my on, I haven't played it yet. Uh, I'm waiting for word on if Jake Hayner is going to play for Fresno State, going to Wyoming. Uh, that loss, they've been off a of bye week. They lost to Hawaii at the island. Uh, you know, Jake Hayner, I'm glad they got the win over UCLA, but he took so many shots. We don't know exactly how healthy he is. He isn't practicing this week. He's in a boot. Uh, if he's not at quarterback for Fresno State, then Wyoming plus three and a half is a gift. Yeah, that's where it's at awesome. right now at FanDuel is uh, Wyoming plus three and a half for that one. So keep tabs there and potentially far away if we get more word later on. That is Colin Wilson. Make sure you check out all of his work over at the Action Network. Find him on Twitter at underscore Colin one. Colin, we appreciate the time. Good luck to you across college football week seven. Good luck uh, to Arkansas as well. We'll hopefully yeah. talk to you again soon. Thank you guys very much. We'll pick Suey. Covering the future. Big thank you once again to Colin Wilson for swinging by and breaking down college football week number seven. And Ed, you had a chance to pat yourself on the back and did not. Uh, we're talking about Coach O with LSU because last year, pretty early on in the year, I don't remember if it was on this show or on the football analytics show, you talked about Ed Orgeron being like potentially Malzahn at some point. You called that like early last year, and now it's kind of playing out, and you didn't pat yourself on the back. So I'm here to do that for you and let people know that, well, hey, you were onto this pretty early. Well, look, the man still has a job, so let's, let's right, not right, get sure, ahead sure. of ourselves. But it's but like the fact it's possible, I don't think people would have would have ever expected heading into like partway through 2020. Right. Look, I just don't trust Coach O. Uh, I somehow bet LSU against uh, uh, L, uh, UCLA earlier this year. I don't really know what I was thinking. Kind of goes against, you know, maybe I still had the memory of 2019 when yeah. I think they covered a lot of, they, I think they covered quite a bit. I know they covered against Clemson in the title game. And yeah, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's wild. It's wild down there uh, in the SEC where you can just get talent and go all the way. And you're only ever one season away from uh, the top of the, I mean, not everywhere. Vanderbilt's not one year away from the top of the hill in college football, but a lot of those programs that do recruit well, LSU certainly one of them, Auburn certainly one of them. And um, yeah, I don't know really what to say. I guess I, you know, like Gene Chizik, I didn't, I didn't think was the greatest coach. You could kind of tell that from his previous tenure at Iowa state. 
And then uh, Coach O uh, is a personality for sure and can certainly recruit. But, you know, in terms of managing the game, it, it's been tough. And uh, the wheel seems to have come off. And you see these guys leaving now. And again, like if I were in Derek Stingley Jr.'s position, I know that he's not like fully healthy, but like, you know, I might think about my future too. So they're making business decisions. I would do the same thing. So I think that it makes sense and it's probably not going to get better uh, from that perspective anytime soon. Let's move now into covering the future. Ed, what are you talking about for this week across college football? Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely interested in this Big Ten matchup with Rutgers at Northwestern. Uh Uh-oh. So these are two teams that are kind of headed in opposite directions. So for Rutgers, Greg Shiano uh, started his second tenure at the school last year in 2020. Kind of went under the radar, but, but he was three and six. Uh, last season in only Big Ten games, and that might not seem impressive, except uh, Rutgers had won a total of three Big Ten games in the previous four years before it showed up. And last year, they made some pretty big strides on defense and have really doubled down on that in 2021. Currently, they rank 21st when I look at my adjusted success rate. This was even higher before the last two games against uh, Ohio State and, and Michigan State. So they're doing pretty well on that side of the ball. The offense has been respectable. They're 56th when I look at my adjusted success rate. And quarterback Noah Vidral really gave a good Michigan defense some fits uh, in that game in Ann Arbor with some of the read option plays. So there's certainly an offense that can move the ball. So on the other side of the ball, um, you know, Northwestern hasn't really been the best season. But let's go back to last season when, uh, you know, they had a 7-2 record. And had Peyton Ramsey, the transfer from Indiana quarterback, made the Big Ten championship game. And was they were competitive against Ohio State until uh, Ohio State kept giving Trey Sermon the ball. <laughs> and over the offseason, uh, they lost longtime uh, defense quarter Mike Hankowitz. And you lose a talent like Greg Newsom to the first round of the NFL draft. And um, it's been bad on defense. You know, they're 116th when I look at adjusted success rate. And this is a program that's really – been good on that side of the ball uh through most of the at least for the last four or five years that that i can remember the offense also isn't as good turns out peyton ramsey was pretty good and his replacements uh are not as good so the 27th when i look at adjusted success rate the primary model i use likes workers by four still has a memory of you know, this preseason when we expected, you know, probably like uh, Northwestern by maybe a touchdown in this game. And then based on data from the current season, uh, Rutgers expect to win by about 15. So I do believe there is value at Rutgers minus two. Um, there, were be- there were better numbers on Monday, but, but uh, I still think there's value in this number. Yeah, you texted me on Monday asking if there was any reason why Northwestern should be favored when it was Northwestern, I believe, minus one. And my mouth dropped a bit. <laughs> I was like, How? How are they favored? I know this is like a biased burn Northwestern fan here, but like what have they done this year to give you any hope they could possibly cover this number? Like the second half against Duke, they played fine, but that's Duke. They were okay against Ohio, but that's Ohio. The Nebraska game, they got torched with Helinski at quarterback. Like that wasn't Hunter Johnson anymore. That was Helinski. And like, right. What reason do you have to think that this team, like, I think like, uh, like, I don't know what the team total is for Northwestern, but, like, it, 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 they can't be expected to score, you know, as many as, like, 22 or whatever any points based on this this uh, spread in the total. Like, I just don't know why we'd expect them to score points in this game. Right. Yeah, we'll see. There there also could be that Rutgers is a little bit overrated. but Maybe. But they've been pretty good so far this season. and uh, I can see we'll the defense improving just because there was so much tur- turnover and they did have the the changes in the personnel, uh, you know, with the uh, with the tenth coordinator. But, like, I don't think they'll regress enough to erase this offense. And that's going to be – that's going to be tough. Uh, they're a very easy team for me to not watch uh, despite my allegiances. I'm okay with uh, not putting those games on TV for the rest of the year. So, Ed is on Rutgers minus two over in Evanston. My cover in the future is focused in the NFL for one of two bets for this week. I want the Cowboys minus four against New England. And the Cowboys are a team that's 5-0 and against the spread, the only team that is still undefeated against the spread this year, which I assume meant that they would get a lot of respect from the book coming into this game. And the Cowboys are a very public team. Books often overreact to teams overperforming the spread like this. So I expected this to be a situation where the Cowboys be big favorites. They're getting a lot of buzz right now. 
I thought that that maybe I'd be backing New England in this game, but I don't think that's the case based on where the number is at right now. The Cowboys, four-point favorites in Foxborough, and I'm going to lay the four here and go with Dallas. Most of that's because I just think the Cowboys are legit. Uh, they are up to fifth in my power rankings behind the Chiefs, Bucks, Rams, and Bills. The Patriots, nowhere near the top five. And part of that is because my prior was low on them coming into this year because rookie quarterback, not the best skill position guys. Defense should be better with the opt-outs coming back in and Matthew Judon being there, but I wasn't expecting them to be an amazing defense. And my prior was low, but the 2021 data is also pretty bad. The Patriots rank 30th in schedule adjusted offense based on number fires metrics. They are 19th on defense. Meanwhile, the Cowboys are third in both. Now, the defensive one, very fluky because it is heavily aided by turnovers. I'm guessing the success rate numbers would not put them anywhere near the top five. But I think that they're better than average on defense, and I'm on board with the offense being a top five offense right now. So if I look at my numbers here, they've got the Cowboys favored by 7.1 points. And even though I have, I'm a bit light on home field, even if I were to adjust that to be a full three, I would still see a lot of value in this game. So I'm fine going ahead right now and laying four with Dallas on the road against New England for this week. But I do want to hear your thoughts on this because, again, like I said, my priors on New England are pretty low. Priors in Dallas are pretty high, which is which has played out well. But that also could lead to potentially things being overvalued after things have looked good so far. So what are your thoughts here on Cowboys versus Patriots? Yeah, I mean the Cowboys. I mean, I think their top their their offense is top five, and I think that's the potential that we thought they had coming into this season. Their defense is exactly average. When I look at uh, passing success rate adjusted for schedule, I think that is a very good result for that yeah. defense. Given given what happened last year, uh, Diggs has been a great cornerback. So yeah, I mean all all the prospects. Um, yeah, no, I, th- I think that it, that is right for Dallas. Uh, I'm not really sure what to think of New England. Uh, it, it's always difficult with a rookie quarterback. And, you know, my numbers are telling me to bet a lot on rookie quarterbacks. I'm not always taking that advice. So, um, yeah, New England's a team I still need to dig into a little bit more. Okay, so we'll talk more NFL tomorrow, but I am for now on the Cowboys minus four against New England. That is all that we have here for today on the college football edition of Covering the Spread. As, but as mentioned, we are back once again tomorrow to break down NFL week six with Joe Ostrowski getting his thoughts on the best games across week number six. Big thank you once again to Colin Wilson of the Action Network. Find him on Twitter at underscore Colin one and check out his work over the Action Network and see his thoughts on week seven over there. Ed, what is going on for you this week over at the Power Rank? I had uh, George Harari from PFF on the Football Analytics Show. Great conversation. We talked a lot about explaining analytics to the public on Sunday Night Football. Talked a lot about a story. He he started an AP Calculus course in Compton. Got a bunch of kids to, to pass that test. That's cool. Which I thought was pretty awesome. Yeah. And talked some football talk some betting. So it was a great conversation. Check that out. The football analytics show. Uh, my free email newsletter is on sports betting, uh, looking to be valuable, concise and entertaining for you every week. So check that out at the And to find Ed on Twitter at the power rank and get the conversation with George by searching for the football analytics show. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow the FanDuel podcast network at FanDuel podcast. Big thank you to everyone for tuning in for today. We'll talk to you once again tomorrow to break down NFL week six. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel podcast network. What's up guys. This is Jordan Spieth. If you're watching this video, please like and subscribe to the FanDuel YouTube channel.